Hi, I'm Ryan from Make Test Battle, and this video is aimed at people who are just getting started into flywheel and lipo based blasters, or for those of you who want a bit of a refresher. In this first video, I hope to cover all of the aspects in a flywheel lipo build and go over the reasons as to why you want certain components as opposed to others. By the end of the video, I hope that you'll be able to take all of the information and go and confidently purchase all of the components that you need while understanding why you want to buy them as well. One of the most common questions that comes up is what battery do I buy? And by the end of this video, you'll be able to answer that. But before we start talking about batteries, we need to go over the other components because battery selection is only half of the problem. Flywheel blasters have four major components. The motors, obviously, the batteries, obviously, the micro switch, less obviously, and then the wire to hold it all together. Click here to jump to the motor section, here for the battery section, here for the micro switch section, and here for the wire section. Before we start talking about batteries, let's start at the beginning. And for a flywheel blaster, that's the motors. The motors are gonna dictate all other components you buy, so it's important to understand them before we get to the rest of it. Motors are a device that convert the electrical energy stored in your battery into the kinetic energy in the flywheel that then propels the dart. The brush DC motors that we use use magnets and an electromagnetic coil that's powered by a commutator. I'll get to why that's important later. I go over motors in much more detail in this future video. Brushing past exactly what makes a motor spin, we arrive at how well they spin. Motors have four key performance specs that we're interested, and they are the maximum torque, the maximum RPM, the operating voltage, and the stall current. The first two of these define how well the blaster will perform, whereas the latter two dictate what battery we need to pick. I've written a paper covering in more detail how a flywheel blaster propels its darts, and you can find that down in the description. But to summarize, the findings is that basically you want a blaster turning at about 25,000 RPM with a little bit of wiggle room to allow a higher rate of fire. So that leaves us at about 35-ish thousand RPM, which gives us our first key performance value, the maximum RPM. For the motors that power the pusher in a rapid strike, there's a bit more of a variation because the rate of fire of the rapid strike is going to depend on the RPM of the motor. Now, the exact rate of fire that you get out of a certain motor is a little bit difficult to predict, but for almost every motor available, someone has probably already built it before and you could easily find some information on what they get. The next performance parameter that we need to discuss is torque. Torque is like force, but in a circle. The more torque that a motor has, the faster the flywheels will rev up. As a consequence of how these motors work, a brushed DC motor will have zero torque at its maximum RPM. So for reference, we use the stall torque, which is its torque at zero RPM. So why does torque matter? It's pretty simple. The more torque a motor has, the faster the flywheels get going. Let me show you a comparison. In Nerf motors, there are two very broad categories of motors and those are 130 motors and 180 motors. 130 motors generally have lower torque than 180s, but they're much simpler to fit in shells. Some examples of 130s are our MTB Rhinos and Honey Badger motors, but there are also other motors, such as the Black Piglet motors or the Banshee motors. The 180 motors, on the other hand, are much longer and will usually require shell cutting, but have much more torque and power. And some examples of those are the MTB Hellcats and Wolverines, as well as motors such as the XP 180 motors. Comparing Rhinos to the direct 180 Hellcat upgrades, we can clearly see the difference in the torque. <coughs> Rhinos have a stall torque of 290 gram centimeters, whereas Hellcats are three and a half times higher at 740 gram centimeters. So the higher torque of the Hellcats means that there's less time from when you press the rev trigger to when you can start firing, and it also means that there's less time in between shots before they rev back up to full velocity, which means you can shoot faster before they start to drop off. So what are the differences then between the different types of 130 and 180 motors? Well, other than the torque that they have, one of the big things is the voltage that they need. Voltage is important in motors. If you double the voltage that you supply a motor, you'll actually double the rest of its performance stats. You'll double its RPM and you'll double its torque. 
but if you push it too far, you'll actually get the motors burning out, which is no good. And way back, I mentioned two things that a motor has, and that's the commutator and the coil. Now, you don't need to understand exactly what they are, but those are the two parts that break on a motor. Now, the commutator in stock motors has two flimsy metal brushes, and if you use a voltage that's too high, the arcing and the wear can quickly cause them to, you know, just get wrecked. The very simple solution that, and the one that's present in every single good aftermarket motor, is a carbon brush instead of a metal brush. They're much more durable and they don't wear out. Now you can take non-carbon brush motors and put carbon brushes on if you have that skill, but every single one of the MTB motors has carbon brushes and you'll find nearly every single good motor does. The one that's a bit more tricky to control is the coil. Now, when you put more voltage through, that coil gets hotter, and you'll eventually reach a point where that heat can cause the wire inside to melt and snap. Now, there's no really good way of accounting for that other than, you know, maybe adding a fan to cool it, but the, the key message there is to just use the motors as they're intended. You don't need to run a Rhino motor on a 6S LiPo. Don't do it. So the next thing that we need to talk about, and something that starts to trip people up a little bit, is the current draw. Now, when a motor like this is stopped, when it's not spinning, and you apply the voltage, it has a very large spike in current, and then as it accelerates and reaches its maximum RPM, it drops off to a much, much, much lower current. For best performance, we need to make sure that the batteries that we pick are able to supply that initial, what is referred to as stall current. If our battery can't supply that current, then our spin-up times will be significantly affected. For example, MTB Rhinos and Honey Badges respectively are rated at about 10 to 15 amps each for stall current, and the Hellcats and Wolverines are rated from about 25 to 50 amps stall current. And that's the price that you pay to get the extra torque out of the 180 motors, much higher current draws. It's important to emphasize the point that if the motor doesn't get enough current from the battery, its torque will be reduced and its spin up times will be increased. And you really don't want that because then you're just wasting the potential that your motor has. So after we've gone through all of this, you should understand a little bit about the torque and the maximum RPM and how they affect performance. And you should also understand a little about overvolting and picking a battery that has the right current and why that's important. So with that, let's get on to the next most important part of the build, the batteries. So in the context of this video, I'm going to be talking exclusively about lithium polymer batteries because it's what I personally use and it's what I'm most familiar with. But that doesn't mean there aren't other types of chemistry such as LIFE, or nickel metal hydride batteries that also exist. And those batteries are perfectly capable of powering, but you'll need to change some of the things that I say, such as the cell count and stuff like that. So first we wanna pick a battery that has the right voltage. Now, lithium polymer batteries are made up of a series of cells, and each cell has a voltage when it's fully charged of about 4.2 volts, and we usually call it flat at about 3, 3.2 volts, depending on how safe you wanna be. And by building up a series of cells, you get the final battery pack. So the code for LiPo batteries is actually pretty simple. S is the number of cells that are in series, and P is the number that are in parallel. But you don't see that much nowadays. So for example, if you had a battery that was a 10S2P, that LiPo pack would have 20 individual cells made up in two parallel sets of 10 in series. So it would have a voltage of between 42 and 30 to 32 volts. You wouldn't see that LiPo in real life. Um, that's just a ridiculous combination I made off the top of my head. And as battery technology has gotten better, you rarely, rarely see the P designation nowadays. So 99.9% .9 of the time when we're dealing with Nerf, you'll probably see either 3S or 2S LiPos, which means a 3-cell LiPo or a 2-cell LiPo. Now a 3-cell LiPo is generally regarded as having a voltage of 11.1 .1 volts and a 2S LiPo of about 7.4. Now if you think back to what I said, a fully charged at 4.2 volts, you'll look at those numbers and go, that's not right. 11.1 .1 divided by 3, that's not 4.2. Well the reason is pretty simple. A LiPo battery, after it discharges a little bit, 
drops quite rapidly to 3.7 volts, and then it stays there until it's almost flat, and then it quickly drops down to zero. So before we get too lost in content that belongs in this video, we have our first answer, the voltage of the battery. Rhinos and Hellcats will use a 3S LiPo, whereas for uh, Honey Badgers and Wolverines, you'll want a 2S LiPo. Honey Badgers and Wolverines are designed for 6 volts, but a 2S is 7.4 volts. So that's about a 25% overvolt. So you'll use a bit more current, a bit more amps, you'll spin a bit faster, a bit more torque. Whatever. Sue me. So that brings us back to amps, and this is one of the main sticking points for new people into LiPo batteries. How do I pick a battery that has enough current for the motors that I use? And that actually links into another question of how big a battery do I get? I'll explain why. So let's try and understand why this can be a little bit confusing. And it comes down to the way the current is reported. Battery manufacturers don't report the actual amps that a battery can output. What they give you is called a C rating. To get the maximum current output of a battery, we multiply its C rating by its capacity. C for current, C for capacity, very creative. To see the maximum capacity for this battery, we take its C rating, which is 65, and multiply it by its capacity in amp hours, which for this battery is one. 65 times one, 65 amps, very simple. Battery capacity is also often reported in milliamp hours because bigger numbers are better. So if you see something that says 1000 or 2200, just divide that by 1000 to get the capacity in amp hours. But hold up, a lot of these batteries have two different C ratings. What's going on with that? Well, that comes down to another thing with LiPo batteries. They are often given a burst and continuous C rating. So the burst C rating is what the battery can do for 10 seconds before you have to drop it down so that it doesn't get too hot and damage itself. While it's better to use the continuous rating for the battery, you can definitely get away with using its burst C rating. Because remember when we talked about current from the motor, you only get that stall current for a very short period of time. If you use the continuous rating, you can feel a bit safer that your battery isn't going to be damaged if the motors jam shut and draw that current continuously. But you've got 10 seconds with the burst, so you're probably going to recognize your motors aren't spinning in 10 seconds. So yeah, it's, it's not too important. Um, so takeaway is use the continuous, and if not, go for burst. You'll probably find that if you're designing a build for 180 motors, you'll probably be pushed towards using the burst C rating. So to be very clear, having a C rating that's too high does absolutely nothing bad to your motors. It's only for the maximum current output that the C rating matters. So if you have one that's way higher than what you need, it doesn't matter, it's perfectly fine. The motors are only going to draw what they need from the battery. If your battery can output a thousand amps and your motor only tries to draw one amp, yeah, that's what happens. Now there's one more part to choosing a battery with the right amp output. A battery with twice the C rating will have twice the output, but a battery with twice the capacity will also have twice the output. This is where the process becomes a little bit more organic. Your battery choice is going to start to be dictated by the size that you have available and also your budget. And I can't tell you how much of each of those that you have. A Strife that's been modified by our guide can fit a battery that's about 18 millimeters thick in it, but a battery tray expander or a different blaster will have a completely different available area to fit the battery. So one of the tools I find really helpful is the LiPo Finder on Hobby King. It allows you to put in the three dimensions that you have available and then it will give you back batteries that are within that size and also of a certain capacity and C rating. So it makes it really easy to pick a battery that will fit and also has the right discharge capabilities. Let's go through a quick example. My MP5 SD at the moment has two Hellcat motors in it which draw about 25 amps each at stall. Multiply that by two, you get 50 amps that we need. The battery that I have is a 65C 90C 1 amp hour LiPo, which means it has a continuous of 65 amps and a burst of 90. Easily good enough for the motors that I have. So that makes it a good battery choice. It fits inside the expander, and so it works. Before I finish on batteries, I must address the elephant in the room. 14500 sized IMRs and trust fires. 
Simply put, these simply do not have high enough C ratings in order to power 130 or 180 motors. Maybe some of the top tier 14500 IMRs can power 130 motors, but none are acceptable for 180 builds. Good quality 18650 batteries, on the other hand, are quite good, and some can successfully power high current 180 motors, but they don't fit in a stock battery tray, so in my opinion, LiPo packs are the way to go. There's also another slightly more technical reason why 14500 batteries aren't the way to go. When a battery is put under load, its voltage sags, and in 14500 IMRs, this is very significant, and so you're actually undervolting the motor while it's spinning up. Whereas in a LiPo pack, the voltage is much more consistent at high current draws. LiPo battery packs are designed for high current outputs. That's why they exist. They're designed for doing backflips in quadcopters and going straight vertical in ducted fan jet aircraft. It's, it's what they're for, so using something like this, is, it's just pushing a battery into a role it's not made for. So that brings us full circle for selecting the battery. First, you pick the one that has the right cell count, either 2S or 3S, and then you narrow down a selection of batteries that have the right combination of size, capacity, and C rating in order to fit in your build. For reference, for a 3S battery, the Zippy Compact 25C 1000 mAh 3S, link in the description, works really well in a stock strife, and that's what we use in our videos, and for a 2S, you can use the 2S 1300 mAh Zippy Compact. For a 180 build, you will almost certainly need a much bigger battery, and so you'll probably need to go with an expander there. So the possibilities in that case are much, much more varied. Okay, so the motors and the battery were the hard part. Let's get to the last two easy parts. First, the micro switch. Just like the coil inside the motor, the micro switch can burn out if it takes too much current. So the stock ones are pitifully incapable of supporting replacement motors with LiPo batteries. So the advice I have to give you for selecting a replacement micro switch is going to sound a bit dodgy, but find something that just looks chunky. Um, most of these are rated at much higher voltages than what we use, and usually for AC current instead of DC. Now, there's a lot of technical reasons why it's different, but if you find something that you know looks chunky and looks like it'll work, it probably will. Anything is going to be better than a stock micro switch. So, bad advice, but it's the best I've got. So if you want, check the description for a link to the switch that we use. There's another more advanced method of switching blasters, and that's using a relay or a MOSFET. Now, if you really want, let me know and I can do a video that I'll put here, but those are a lot more complicated, and what you've basically got is a small switch that electrically turns on another much beefier switch, and there's a lot of credit to using those, but they're a bit more complicated. If you find a good micro switch, you'll be fine. So the final component is wire. Fortunately, wire is very easy. First of all, you want multi-stranded wire. Simple. Second thing, the thicker the wire you have, the better. Thicker wire allows more current to flow through it, which means you get more performance out of your motors. There is no advantage to using thinner wire when you can get away with using thicker wire. Wire is usually sized with AWG, and the smaller the number, the thicker it is just backwards, whatever. I normally use 18 AWG wire, but if you can get away with it, 16 and 14 also work quite well. For high draw 180 motors, you probably want to push more towards 16 or 14 if you can manage, but it becomes more difficult to fit them in the shell. So wire comes in a variety of different insulating materials. I prefer using silicone coated wire, but I've also used PVC wire. It's cheaper, but it's a lot more difficult to fit in the shell. Silicone wire is just really nice. It fits just super easily. Now, the other thing you need to make really sure of is color. Make sure you get wire that is positively and negatively colored, because if you have two positively colored wires, the electrons won't be able to flow out of the motors. <laughs> I hope you understood that was a joke. Color doesn't matter. Silicone wire is really cool because you can find it in a crazy variety of colors. Uh, I did a bill for Adrian that had orange and white colored wires. I only say this because it came up once. The wire color doesn't matter. I buy this 18AWG silicone wire from a local electronics store, but there's many places you can get it online, and I've got a description link below. So that's it. 
You should now understand choosing motors, selecting appropriate battery, picking a better micro switch, and then choosing the right wire. There are a few little odd bits that didn't quite fit in the rest of the video, so I'll cover those before we wrap up. Before I do that, this video took a lot of effort to produce, so if you enjoyed it, be sure to subscribe, and if you want to directly support us, be sure to check out our Patreon. This video's Patreon shout-out is Tom Aquinas, who is an old HVZ admin, and if you're interested, you can actually find a very old uh, loadout video that Justin did of his on his old channel. Okay, so, quick little tips that I wasn't able to cover in the main video. Firstly, battery plugs. From Hobby King, most of the batteries that you'll find have XT60 connectors on them. But some of them have DEANs, some of them have JSTs, there's a lot of different type of battery connectors. So just make sure to get the right male battery connectors to the battery that you buy. Secondly, charging, storage and care for LiPos. Now, there's a lot of hubbub about this, but LiPos are not going to murder you in your sleep. To charge a LiPo, buy a good balancing charger and charge it at its capacity in amps. If you've got a 1000 milliamp hour battery, charge it at 1 amp. 2000 milliamp hour battery, charge it at 2 amps. Very simple. You could also buy one of those charging bags or a charging box or whatever, but I don't. Uh, I don't have one, but always be sure in that case to keep a constant eye when you're charging. And if something goes wrong, be sure to have some sand nearby if there's a fire. It's also a very good idea to use a AA battery to test your circuit before you plug in a LiPo because that'll allow you to detect any short circuits before you dump a massive amount of current through the short with a LiPo battery. A very useful tool is a voltage tester or voltage alarm. These alarms plug into the balancing port on a LiPo and will beep very loud when it starts to become flat. These things go in model aircraft and are designed to be heard while they're flying around above you. So these are very useful for checking how much charge you have left between rounds so that you don't accidentally over discharge your battery, which is something that you want to avoid. You could also integrate a voltmeter into your shell, but that won't have the audible alarm. It also looks pretty cool, so the choice is yours. But either way, you want some way to check the voltage. So the last thing is about 3D printed parts. There are a plethora of 3D printed motor covers and battery tray expanders available, and you know your exact choice is gonna come down to you. But just remember that if you don't have a 3D printer or you don't have the budget to be able to buy these sorts of things, the community is using Vortex discs for motor covers forever, and there's absolutely no shame in doing that. Thank you for watching this video. If it's helped you understand even one thing better, I'll be satisfied that it's been just educational enough. If there's something that you think that I missed or you didn't quite understand, ask directly below in the comments or on the post on our Facebook page linked in the description so that I can answer you directly or include the content in a future video. Until then, bye!